All right, welcome back. Moving on from the cardiovascular system to the respiratory system, one that is only too relevant these days. Um, so let's get right into it. All right, so when we talk about respiration, if you see the term cellular respiration, what that's referring to is using oxygen in order to make ATP. So we're talking about aerobic metabolism, basically. So in order to get oxygen to a cell so that it can use that oxygen to make ATP, we have to get it into the blood first and then be able to deliver it to the cell. And so what this slide is describing then is the process of getting oxygen from the air that you breathe in into the blood and then eventually getting it to the cell. And so the way that this book breaks it down is that they have four total processes and then you can see the top two occur in the respiratory system. So uh, in the lungs effectively, and then the bottom two occur in the circulatory system. So there's some other terms on there that you might not be entirely familiar with. So pulmonary, we've talked about that uh, in the last chapter, but remember that anything pulmonary deals with the lungs. So we talked about the pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins, which were uh, blood vessels that flowed to and from the heart respectively. Um, and so anything pulmonary then, um, or sorry, not tuned from the heart, tuned from the lungs. Um, anything pulmonary then refers to dealing with the lungs. Ventilation is the process of moving air. So in the context of you know news headlines and things like that that you might be seeing now, you see a lot about ventilators. And so what ventilators do is they're machines that move air. They, they mechanically pump air into the lungs to inflate them. Uh, and they do that under pressure that's adjustable. And so by being able to increase the pressure, you can effectively force oxygen into the bloodstream. So pulmonary ventilation then is the process of moving air into and out of the lungs. So it's just air movement. In terms of respiration, so one of the things to associate with respiration is gas exchange. And so we're primarily just going to talk about, or there are two primary gases that are exchanged. Uh, and so those two are oxygen and carbon dioxide. So on the slides, O2 is obviously oxygen, CO2 is carbon dioxide. So external respiration then refers to the exchange of oxygen, and specifically that oxygen is going to move from the inspired air, which is the air that you breathe in, into the bloodstream. And then carbon dioxide is going to go the opposite direction. So that's external respiration. That is exchanging, picking up oxygen uh, by the bloodstream and dropping off carbon dioxide. Um, the exchange of gases between that alveolar air, the air that we've breathed in, and the bloodstream. That's external respiration. So once we have increased the oxygen capacity or the oxygen, uh, let's go with saturation, that'll work. So once we've increased the oxygen saturation of the blood, so once, we, once, it's, once hemoglobin is effectively full, then we have to transport that oxygenated blood around the body. So then you get the transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide, which of course is the responsibility of the circulatory system, so of the heart and the blood vessels that are associated with it, so the arteries and veins. And then internal respiration, once we take that oxygenated blood and get it down to, let's say, a muscle fiber in the quadriceps group, well now we have to drop off that oxygen that we just picked up. That blood will pick up carbon dioxide, so the muscle cell will offload the carbon dioxide, into the bloodstream, and then that blood with lowered oxygen content, increased carbon dioxide content, returns back to the heart, eventually back to the lungs, and then we start that process all over again. So those are the four basic processes. So you're gonna uh, breathe air in, step one. Step two is you're going to get gas exchange between the air that you breathed in and the bloodstream. So you'll move oxygen into the bloodstream, move carbon dioxide out, then that blood goes back to the heart, we circulate it down to the tissues that need it, so the working muscles for example, drop off oxygen, pick up carbon dioxide, and then just repeat over and over and over, all day, every day. All right, so let's talk about the anatomy of the respiratory system. So as you can see, the from a functional standpoint, it's broken up into the upper respiratory system and the lower respiratory system. And I'm actually gonna click ahead one slide here. All right. So where you get the differentiation between the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract is at the larynx. And so you can see there the larynx over to the left. Um, so everything larynx and, sorry, larynx and inferior is going to be part of the lower 
respiratory tract, and then everything above that, so pharynx and above, is part of the upper respiratory tract. So if somebody gets an upper respiratory tract infection, then what we associate with that is a runny nose. One of the things that you've probably heard about the uh, coronavirus is that one of the symptoms that it causes is lower respiratory uh, issues. And so basically, that's gonna obviously be below the larynx, specifically in the lungs, so it tends to cause uh, fluid accumulation in the lungs. And so that's a, it's a lower respiratory tract infection or it tends to be. It can also affect the upper respiratory tract, but um, typically, again, we're gonna associate upper respiratory tract stuff with you know, just a runny nose. Lower respiratory tract tends to get a little more serious because now we're talking about the lungs, which is where that, that gas diffusion takes place. All right, so as far as the upper respiratory tract goes then, so you can see there in terms of the major organs, so we've got the nose and nasal cavity. Sorry to click back and forth so much. Um, so obviously you know where your, your nose is, and then the nasal cavity is just posterior to it, so all of that's the nasal cavity. So um, that those structures obviously have functions. There are things that they do. So for example, um, in addition to simply providing an airway, providing a way, a mechanism to move air into the body, um, important jobs of the nose and nasal cavity include moistening and warming the air that enters. So that's especially important when the air in the external environment is, is cooler than it is inside of our internal environment. So, you know, in here in Wisconsin, especially um, in the wintertime, that becomes important. So we're going to warm and humidify the air that comes into the nasal cavity. And as part of that, um, you're also going to see, make sure I got my arrow being recorded. There we go. I do. Um, so you're also going to see that there are these three structures here. Sorry, there's one up top. So there's one here, one here, and one here. And so those are the nasal concha. So what they do, they actually do a couple different things. So those are effectively folds in the sinuses. And so they increase the turbulence of the air. They cause it to kind of swirl around. And so that increases the amount of time that air is inside of that nasal cavity, which gives us more time to heat it up and, of course, more time to moisturize the air. And so there's lots of little capillaries in there. So there's lots of really superficial circulation, which helps both um, offload fluid, so that, that's where the humidifying humidification comes from, is actually from that blood plasma um, in some of that extracellular fluid. And then we get a warming because obviously the, the blood that's going to pass through that is going to be fairly warm because it's coming from your core. So the conca there, like I said, there's three of them. Um, doesn't really matter. But uh, what they do, you know, so they do those two things. They allow for turbulence. They slow the airflow down, which allows us to heat it up and humidify it, which is going to be really important. Other things that we get in that nasal cavity serves as a resonating chamber for speech, so it changes how you sound a little bit, so it, it sort of modifies the sounds made by the larynx. Um, and then we've got our olfactory, which are our smell receptors there as well. So one of the things um, that I was thinking of recently in terms of the nasal cavity and, and warming and humidifying the air is actually in really extreme heat, the nasal cavity can serve to uh, cool down that air uh, as well. So, and this came up, I was listening to a podcast where they were asking a, a physician about the idea that um, one of the things that could prevent you from getting the coronavirus, I think if you'd already been exposed, um, or to keep it from, from becoming so problematic was to go sit in a sauna. And so the host of the podcast's uh, idea um, was that so if you go in there and you breathe in this really hot air and you breathe in really deep into your lungs that really hot air is going to kill the virus and so um it's a it's a good thought but that's not how it works and so the reason that's not how it works is again so if you're breathing in so if you're sitting in a sauna and the ambient temperature in there i don't know what dry saunas are um usually hot tubs are like 104 so i'm gonna guess a dry sauna is somewhere around 120 something like that um but nonetheless if you're breathing in really hot air that nasal cavity is going to cool that air down some because that really hot air, if it actually made it down to the lungs at a temperature of something like 120, that would do some damage to the lung tissue and we can't have that. So um, the thought of basically cooking the virus by breathing in really hot air is an interesting idea, but it wouldn't work because our body is really good at trying to uh, regulate the things that get inside. And so one of the things that we'll do if you're sitting in a sauna is you'll actually cool the air down a little bit using that sinus cavity. And obviously it's going to lose some of its heat as it goes down the, the rest of the respiratory tract as well. 
Um, so this, the nasal cavity then works to both warm and humidify, but also if you're in really hot air, it, it serves to cool the air down as well. So once the air makes it past the nasal cavity, then it goes back here, there we go, into the pharynx. So there's, there's three sections of the pharynx, and we'll talk about that a little bit more with the, um, when we get to the digestive tract. But the three sections, just for now, because you'll hear it again next week or the next time I make one of these, um, is so you've got the nasopharynx, which is up here. It's kind of the back of the nose. And then you have the oropharynx. So anything oral is the mouth. So the oropharynx is the part of the back of the mouth. And then you have the laryngopharynx, which is down here, the most inferior, inferior part of the pharynx. Other things about the, the nasal cavity. So the nasal cavity, as you'd expect, is lined with uh, mucous membranes. And so it's primarily, that, that particular epithelium is primarily goblet cells. And remember that one of the things that goblet cells do is they make a lot of mucus. And so that mucus contains um, secretions that, that help our immune system, that basically attack viruses and bacteria that we normally breathe in. So there are particular um, enzymes that we make um, as well as, as uh, different proteins, so particularly lysosome, lysozymes and defensins, and so those will help attack any sort of invading bodies. Um, and I think I've hit on all the important stuff there. All right, so that's the nose and the nasal cavity. Um, the paranasal sinuses, so I'm going to click a little bit to get to those. All right, so the paranasal sinuses, so you've got sinuses there, you can see one here, the frontal sinus. So that's in the frontal bone, which is one of your skull bones. And then we've got one back here, which is in the sphenoid bone. That's one, another one of the skull bones. And then there is um, also a sinus in the ethmoid bone and in the maxillary bones. And so those sinuses do a few things. The first thing that they do is they lighten the skull because they are air pockets in the bone. And so if that was solid bone, it would obviously be heavier. So the fact that those are air pockets in there or yeah, that's probably the easiest way to think about it. Think of them as air pockets. Um, and so then what they do is they lighten the skull. But in addition to that, so those are also going to have some epithelium that will secrete mucus. So they are connected to the nasal sinuses. And so they can secrete mucus. And then they are um, open to the nasal cavity. And so they also play a role. I'm just messing with the arrow at this point. They also play a role in warming and moistening the air that we breathe in. I'm gonna turn off my arrow. All right, so those are the nasal sinuses. We talked about the pharynx. So remember the pharynx is at the um, posterior part of the nose, posterior part of the mouth. And so on this particular sagittal cut, you can see the soft palate and the uvula. The uvula is the thing if you open your mouth and say, ah, really big, that's the thing you can see in the back of your mouth. So the soft palate, its job, and we'll talk about this again with the digestive tract, but its job is to separate the nasal cavity from the oral cavity, so your nose from your mouth, effectively. And so what it does is whenever you swallow food, that soft palate is going to bump up against the back of the throat, and I'll turn my pointer back on. So when you swallow food, this is obviously going to close this off, and so that keeps food from moving up inside of the nasal cavity. And of course, that doesn't always go exactly as planned. So if you ever, you know, laughed while you were taking a drink or something and sometimes, you know, shot milk out your nose or something like that, right? Effectively, what happened there is as you were going to laugh, you were expelling air. And so the soft palate stayed open. And so then you had this sort of mix of food and air, uh, or in that case, fluid and air here at the back uh, in the oropharynx, and so it caused an ejection of that up into the nasal cavity. So that's what happened there. So there's a soft palate, as I mentioned. The other thing here is the hard palate. Uh, and so we'll talk about that when we get to the skull bones. So we'll talk about that a lot in, not a lot, but we'll talk about that some in lab, because I'll mention a couple of the bones that help form that hard palate that separate the sinus cavity from the oral cavity. All right, so we talked about the larynx, I mean the pharynx, sorry. Um, yeah, there we go. Talked about the pharynx. So again, nasopharynx, oropharynx, and then laryngopharynx. Turn my pointer back off. Oop, it was off. All right. Um, and then click around a little bit. There we go. All right. So now we're on to the lower respiratory tract. So again, the lower respiratory tract starts with the larynx. And so the larynx, again, the easiest way to think about that is as your voice box. So that is one of its jobs. 
But then the other important thing you can see there is that there is the intersection basically of the digestive tract and also of the respiratory tract there in, in and around the larynx. So, pull my uh, pointer back up, there we go. So again, uh, laryngopharynx down here. So here's the larynx. And then as we go further down, as we, we move inferiorly, then we move into the trachea. Um, and then this back here is the esophagus. So whenever you swallow food, it's gonna be routed down the esophagus, which then goes down through the diaphragm and down into the stomach, which would be about here. So uh, in the larynx then, that's where we're going to route food and air into their proper channels. So you've got the epiglottis, which is a little flap that's gonna fold over the larynx. So whenever you swallow, the epiglottis is going to flap shut. I'm trying to remember if I have a picture of that. I don't think I do, but it's okay for now. Um, at any rate, the epiglottis is going to flap shut or snap shut, and so that'll keep food from going down into the respiratory tract because if you, that's called aspiration, if you get food down into the respiratory tract, then obviously um, that's going to be something that's going to be, uh, can bring bacterial infections much more easily. So um, we try to prevent that because then you can get bacterial infections in the lung and then that leads to pneumonia and, you know, that's bad. So at the larynx then, that's where we're going to route the food either into the digestive tract or the respiratory tract. All right, so we covered the larynx as part of the lower respiratory tract or at the start of the lower respiratory tract. Then air moves from the larynx, keeping, uh, keeping moving inferiorly into the trachea. So the trachea is more colloquially known as the windpipe. And so it is going to be held open by 16 to 20 C-shaped cartilage rings. And you can see those rings on the diagram here. So these little blue or purple things, whatever color that looks like to you, those are cartilage rings that help hold the trachea open because if we didn't have those, every time we would breathe out or every time we're actually actively moving air in or out, the trachea would, would close if it was like the esophagus. And so that would increase dramatically the cost of breathing, the energy cost of breathing. And so to minimize the energy cost of breathing, we have cartilage that helps hold that trachea open. So that's an important function of that cartilage. So that trachea then, or the main windpipe, is going to divide into two main bronchi. So as we move inferiorly, so we've got the right and left bronchus. So um, obviously then this one's gonna go to the right lung. Yeah, I know it's on your left as you're looking at the slide. So remember when we talked about the heart that we're, we're discussing here, the patient's right or the patient's left, or the athlete's right or the athlete's left. And so this, primary bronchus would then go toward the right lung. This one would go toward the left lung. So we've got two of those. And then those are going to branch off into secondary bronchi, or a bronchus is singular. And so there are three of those on the right, and then two of those on the left. And the reason for the number difference, there's only two pictured on the right side on this drawing, but that's okay. The reason for that difference is that each one goes to a different lobe of the lung. The right side of the lung has three lobes. The left side of the lung only has two lobes. And the reason for that is because, remember, your heart is a little bit more oriented toward your left. And so the left lung is a little bit smaller. It's only going to have two lobes. So from those three secondary bronchi, now we're going to get even smaller. So now we're going to get into tertiary bronchi and then eventually down into bronchioles. And so as you notice here that as we move inferiorly and laterally in real life, um, as we move inferiorly and laterally, that there's less and less cartilage, right? So you've got this really obvious solid cartilage up here. And then as we move farther and farther down, we have less and less cartilage. So those, um, as we get into the bronchioles, those are held open by a combination of smooth muscle, but then also elastic fibers are going to help hold those open. So once we get down into the bronchioles then, those are less than a millimeter in diameter, so those are pretty small. And then when we get into the terminar uh, sorry, terminal bronchioles, uh, those are less than a half a millimeter in diameter. So now we're getting into um, pretty small little airways. And then eventually we end up in the alveoli. And so these little um, pockets, if you will, they kind of look like, they kind of look like grapes on, on, a, uh, on a branch or We'll stick with that. 
they kind of look like grapes, right? And so uh, that's where gas exchange actually takes place. And so you got a little alveolus here. So alveoli, for what it's worth, is plural. Alveolus is singular. So you have a little alveolus here, another one here. And so this one is a respiratory bronchiole. Remember, anytime you've got respiration, you've got gas exchange. And so this one is a respiratory bronchiole because of this alveolus. So because of this structure, the alveolus, you have some gas exchange that can take place there. So we can pick up oxygen, drop off carbon dioxide here. And then as we keep moving farther into the respiratory tract, we eventually reach the terminals down here, which are the alveolar sacs. And then those are just essentially kind of bundles of grapes. You've got lots and lots of sacs um, and they're hollow that are gonna uh, increase the surface area so we can maximize gas diffusion. So we're gonna move from our respiratory bronchioles, which have you know one or two or a very few alveoli into alveolar ducts, which are basically bronchioles that are kind of studded with alveoli and then eventually into the alveolar sacs which are um, you know just alveoli kind of on top of each other so the difference you can see two terms here so you can see the conducting zone and the respiratory zone the primary difference between those two is that in the conducting zone all we do is move air so we move air in move air out but we're, we're not getting respiration we're not getting gas exchange that takes place as opposed to the respiratory zone and you can see down here the respiratory zone starts with the respiratory bronchioles and that is uh, that starts because of these little alveoli. So at the respiratory zone, that's where gas exchange is going to take place. And again, that's going to start in those respiratory bronchioles where we have alveoli. Speaking of alveoli, so we, this slide kind of overlaps with the last one. So we talked about the respiratory bronchioles, we talked about the alveolar ducts, and then eventually we end up down in the alveoli. So again, this is the same information as from the bottom of the last uh, of the table on the last slide that in the respiratory zone, that includes the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and then the alveoli. So again, these alveoli are these little hollow or open sacs where gas exchange takes place. And you can see on this drawing, so obviously the blues are um, deoxygenated blood, the red is oxygenated blood. So then this pulmonary arteriole is gonna be taking deoxygenated blood coming from the right side of the heart, and then this red one, or down here, the venule, is gonna be taking this oxygenated blood back to the heart, right? So in terms of the alveoli, we have lots and lots of them. So different books give you different estimates, but the most common estimate that I've seen is that you have about 300 million alveoli. Um, and so that makes up most of the lung volume, most of the lung surface area. And again, that's the site of actual gas exchange. That's an important thing to know about them other things to know about them so i'm going to kind of go out of order here so this picture these are just pictures from different books this is the this is a picture from the current book that we're using this other one's from an old uh, exercise phys textbook i used to use um so in terms of the alveoli so what you can see here so this is a single alveolus we're just looking at a, a, a basically a sagittal cut here's one here's another one and then here's another one all right so one of the things you'll notice is that they have pores. And so the pores are little openings between the alveoli. So they are interconnected to each other. And so one of the important things about the pores is that helps ensure or equalize pressure throughout the lungs. And so uh, as we breathe air in, it'll move into the alveoli and then it'll be distributed through the, through the alveoli, not only um, coming from the alve alveolar ducts, but then also kind of across the alveoli because of those pores. So that's an important structure that helps them distribute the air evenly and distribute air pressure evenly because, if we click back one, otherwise we would get lots of pressure here in the proximal alveoli and relatively little out here, and so you'd get some differences in gas diffusion. So you get good diffusion up here, less diffusion up here, and so that would obviously be disadvantageous for us, and so the pores help prevent that. The other thing is that if the air pressure got too high in some of these proximal ones, they could possibly be damaged more easily, and so we don't want that. So again, the pores help us to equalize pressure across the alveoli. Surfactant. So surfactant is um, something that is, well, actually, I think it's on here, there you go. Well, type 2 alveolar cell. So if we look at this drawing, so down here where it says type 2 alveolar cell, this little green guy here, what it does is secretes something called surfactant. And so what that does 
um, is helps reduce the surface tension of water. So anywhere you have the interaction of fluid and air, um, especially if that fluid has a really high concentration of water, which obviously the fluid in our lungs does, um, that water tends to kind of stick to itself. Um, and the reason for that is because water is polar, and so it, it uh, is sort of, it's more attracted to itself than the surrounding air. So where you see surface tension, um, if you've ever maybe put a couple drops of water like on a, on a coin, like a penny or something, and you see the way that the water makes kind of a dome, it sort of sticks to itself, right? Or it kind of clings together is another way of thinking about that. That's surface tension. That, that's the, the tendency of water to, to um, not necessarily stick, that's not the, not the right term, but, but the tendency of water to cling to itself. And the same kind of thing, um, if you see things like soap bubbles, there's a neighbor kid blowing bubbles across the street at the moment. Um, if you see things like soap bubbles, one of the things that happens there, one of the things that causes the collapse of soap bubbles, they actually collapse inward because of that surface tension. So it's the water is kind of pulling itself, um, pulling toward itself, and so that causes those bubbles to collapse inward. And so how surface tension relates to surfactant then is surfactant helps break up that surface tension, helps reduce the tendency of water to cling to itself. Because um, since there's some fluid in the lungs, what you're gonna get is that that surface tension makes it harder for the alveoli to expand. Because again, that water is gonna cling to itself, so that water that would be here um, in the alveolus, a little, you know, it's a thin layer, right? So, but there's a little bit of, of water in here. Uh, it's, a, it's a moist surface. And so that water is gonna tend to cling to itself. And so because of that, it's gonna make it hard for the alveolus to open. So to combat that and reduce the energy cost of breathing, these little green cells, the type two alveolar cells, secrete surfactant, which helps break up that surface tension of water. And so you can see a, a similar idea if you've ever, so think about something like an oil droplet. If you're doing dishes and you see, uh, you know, like a droplet of olive oil or something, if you put soap on it, the way that it scatters, it's actually called emulsification, but the way that it scatters, that's kind of what surfactant does to combat the surface tension of water. And so if we, we reduce that tendency of water to stick to itself, we make it easier for the alveoli to inflate, and again, we're gonna reduce the um, energy cost of breathing because, so if we didn't have that, you then have to inspire, you have to breathe in with more force, so that puts more load on the diaphragm and on the intercostal muscles, which are between the ribs that cause you to breathe. So other things in there, so we've got our macrophages. So our macrophages are cells that we associate with the um, immune system, and so they are going to attack any invading bacteria and viruses. So, because obviously, you know, all day long you're breathing in dust and hair, not necessarily big hairs, but you know, particles, um, viruses, bacteria, uh, all kinds of stuff that you're breathing in all day long. And so your immune system is very active in the respiratory tract, and so specifically these macrophages will attack any of those invading bacteria or viruses, they'll uh, phagocytize them, they'll basically chew them up and eat them and internalize them. And then um, when they die, what we do, um, because the um, trachea in particular, um, most of that respiratory tract is ciliated. So most of the epithelium, um, so the, the cells lining the respiratory tract have cilia. And remember the cilia, what they do is they beat one direction. So they actually beat um, up toward the throat. And so those dead macrophages get caught in the mucus that we produce. And then the ciliated cells push those dead macrophages that have eaten up the bacteria and viruses up toward our throat. And then it actually gets swallowed back into the esophagus. And then um, we kill whatever is left inside of the stomach with that really acidic environment. And so one of the fun facts that this particular textbook has is that you uh, carry 2 million dead macrophages per hour by cilia um, back into the digestive tract. So there you go. So uh, there's a pretty high turnover rate on those macrophages. Other things about the alveoli, they're elastic. And so remember, if something is elastic, it's capable of being deformed and then returning to its original shape. So in the case of the alveoli, they can expand. And then because there are elastic fibers uh, around them, around the, the cluster of alveoli, they snap back to their original shape, which then pushes air back out. So the, the fact that they're elastic is one of the things that helps us um, breathe out without using any energy. 
at rest. There are other factors, and we'll talk about those in a minute, but, but that elastic quality of the alveoli is going to help us, again, reduce the energy cost of breathing. And then the last thing on there, which is very important, is that the alveoli are thin-walled. And so you can see here, um, so each one of these things is a single little alveolus, and then the purple thing is its nucleus. So you can see lots of little epithelial cells that, um, and so thinking back to the epithelial, chap sh epithelial chapter, there we go, um, remember we talked about um, different types of epithelium, and we talked about um, simple squamous tissue, right? So simple, you only have one layer thick, and then squamous is kind of square shaped. So these are simple squamous, epithelial cells and so they are really really thin and the reason that's important is because so if we look at so here this is a close-up of this so if you've got your capillary so we have one cell here that makes up the capillary wall and you have another cell here that is that epithelial cell of the lung this the alveolar cell so essentially you've got endothelium and then um, alveolar cell here so um, you've got those two, and then there is a basement membrane between the two, but it's fused. So what well, you've got two cell layers and a really, really thin basement membrane, and so that's going to allow or facilitate gas diffusion much more effectively than a thicker membrane because oxygen and carbon dioxide both move along pressure gradients. So oxygen moves from an area of high pressure, so when we breathe in, there's higher oxygen pressure in the lungs than there is in the blood, so oxygen moves from the area of high pressure to low, so from the air we breathe in into the red blood cell, carbon dioxide goes the other way. And so because they're moving along pressure gradients, um, they d diffuse, but they can't diffuse very far. So if we thicken this membrane, that may be too far for oxygen to diffuse, and so we can't get it into the blood. So the fact that they're thin-walled is going to be really important because that facilitates that oxygen diffusion because it reduces the distance that oxygen has to travel. It can't travel very far based on simple diffusion. All right, so here's why that's important is it relates to something called Fick's Law. And so Fick's Law is there for you on the slide, but I'll read it to you anyway. Fick's Law is that gas diffuses through a tissue at a rate proportional to the surface area and inversely proportional to the thickness. So what does that mean and why does that matter? What that means is that the more surface area you have, the more places you have for gas diffusion to take place. So if we click, let, click back a slide, so this little alveolus, you can see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six capillaries that border it. So the more alveoli we have, the more space we have for gas diffusion to take place, which is why we have 300 million alveoli. So it, what it does is maximize the surface area for gas diffusion to take place. One of the other, other books I've used in the past um, said that if you take out both lungs and were able to spread them out evenly, they would in an adult male, they would take up half of a tennis court. So that's lots and lots of surface area, right? I don't know how they figured that out, but that was, that was the, st the statistic in that book. So at the very least though, lots and lots of surface area. Um, and so that allows, again, more places for gas diffusion, more places for, for oxygen diffusion to take place. Um, so more surface area equals more gas diffusion, so that's good. And then gas diffusion is inversely proportional to the thickness. So the thicker the tissue is, the less gas exchange or diffusion that's going to take place. So the fact that the alveoli, again, the fact that there are lots of them, and the fact that they're thin-walled, we maximize surface area and we minimize thickness of the tissue, both of which facilitate or make easier gas diffusion. So where this comes up is if we do something to affect either of those factors, if we reduce surface area or if we increase the thickness of the membrane, both of those two things are going to make us less able to get oxygen to the blood. And if we can't get oxygen to the blood, we can't get it to the, any of the other tissues, and so they become ischemic, and then obviously that causes tissue damage and potentially death, right? And so what the picture I've got for you here is COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So COPD is caused by long-term exposure to lung irritants that might include things like air pollution, but also chemical fumes, dust, and cigarette smokes. So there's a bunch of different things that can cause it, but smoking is by far the leading cause of it. And so COPD includes uh, emphysema, but also chronic bronchitis. And so effectively what's happened is if somebody has COPD, so if you get this, this chronic exposure to lung irritants like cigarette smoke, then you've got 
and you're all familiar with this probably from your high school health classes, but you've got this accumulation of tar inside of those alveoli. Okay, well, when you've got that tar accumulation that builds up, now you've thickened the membrane. So from the, the standpoint of Fick's law, the thicker that membrane is, the less gas diffusion that's going to take place. So we can't get oxygen to the lungs, so that's obviously problematic. Um, but in addition to that, the chemicals in cigarette smoke are going to cause inflammation and irritation. And so with that inflammation, you're going to get um, essentially damage to some of these alveoli. They're going to lose their elastic quality, and some of them are also going to collapse on themselves. And so what you see here in the picture in the lower right is that we've lost a bunch of the alveoli. So we've lost a bunch of surface area where gas diffusion would normally take place. So in something like cigarette smoking, you've got, um, you effectively attack both sides of, or both components of Fick's law, you reduce surface area because the alveoli, some of them collapse on themselves as a result of the inflammation that ensues because of the chemical irritants, and you increase the thickness of the membrane. Part of the inflammatory process in the lungs too is you're gonna secrete more mucus, as you can see there, um, and that's part of the lungs trying to protect themselves, but the, any, any more mucus that you secrete is going to cause um, an additional thickening of the membrane, right? So the more fluid you've got in the lungs, then that's that much more uh, space um, that oxygen has to diffuse through, and that makes it harder. So in the case of smoking, then that's, like I said, going to attack both aspects of Fick's law and uh, reduce our ability to move oxygen into the bloodstream and also to offload carbon dioxide. So symptoms of, of COPD then intuitively or, or you know making sense would be things like coughing, wheezing, chest tightness, and then shortness of breath. So um, if you can't get enough oxygen to the blood, then we're going to sense that, and we'll talk about uh, the specific sites of that here in a little bit, um, but we will sense that the blood isn't fully saturated with oxygen, so we'll try to increase breathing rate um, in order to offset that, but if you've lost elasticity of the lungs, then that produces more work. Um, higher energy cost, and so that's one. That's kind of the things that add up to produce that sensation of shortness of breath. All right, so just a quick bit about the anatomy of the lungs. Um, so the costal surface, anything costal is ribs. So the costal surfaces of the lungs then are going to interact with the thoracic wall. So in terms of the costal surfaces, there are actually several. So there's uh, an anterior surface, a lateral surface, and then a posterior surface. But again, it's effectively where the lungs interact with the chest wall. The apex, so, so we got a lot of apexes and bases in the structures that we've talked about. So the apex of the lungs are the most superior aspects. You can see the apex up here. So it's where they come to a point at the top. It's usually just below your clavicle, but it varies depending upon body size and configuration. Um, so, but nonetheless, the apex of the lungs are up top. The base of the lungs, the wider area down here on the bottom. And then, as I mentioned earlier, so the right side has three lobes. So you can see there uh, that there's a superior, a middle, and then an inferior lobe on the right side. And then the left side just has a superior and inferior because of the heart here. So where we've got this cardiac notch, there's a little space here um, again, the left lung is a little bit smaller because of the, the area taken up by the heart. So again, left side is a little bit smaller. All right, so let's talk about the mechanics of breathing. So there's two um, parts to the process. There is inspiration and expiration. So inspiration is breathing in, expiration is breathing out. So what happens when we breathe in? Inspiration is an active process, meaning that it requires energy. Expiration, at least when you're at rest, is a passive process. Um, during exercise, expiration is going to become active. We'll actually forcefully exhale. But at rest, we don't do that. So at rest, expiration is passive, doesn't require energy. Inspiration is active. So when we breathe in, um, a few things happen. So you can see here um, on the top left, so um, this is um, sometimes in science classes you'll see where people take like a, a water jug and then they'll have little balloons in there and then a, some sort of a, a rubber um, structure here that's rubber banded on. And so it's meant to mimic the, the chest cavity. But basically what happens is um, when you breathe in, your diaphragm, which is a muscle that separates the thoracic cavity up here from the abdominal cavity down here. So again, those two are separated. This is the diaphragm. 
So when you breathe in, the diaphragm actually flattens and pulls down. And so when that happens, that creates a vacuum inside of the thoracic cavity. So it, it, it as the, the diaphragm pulls down, it expands the size of the lungs. And so as the lungs expand a little bit, then again, that's gonna create that vacuum or that's gonna pull air in. So things about the diaphragm, it is the primary ventilatory muscle. So it's your primary breathing muscle. And because like the heart, it always has to be active. It has a really high mitochondrial volume. So it has lots and lots of mitochondria in those fibers. So many, not as many as the heart, but a lot more than your, your type one fibers. Typically the mitochondrial volume in the diaphragm exceeds your slow twitch fibers by about four times. So it's a very aerobic tissue. So one of the side notes about the diaphragm, if you've ever, um, while you're running, if you ever get a side stitch where you know you're you're running for punishment or sport or fun, whatever your thing is, um, and you get a side stitch, one of the thoughts about what causes that is probably that you know because usually that's a, an injury or not an injury, but a, a problem that occurs when people are deconditioned. So you know it's a preseason issue, or it is that you're not um, in very good shape at the moment. And so you get a side stitch. So the thought of what happens there is that the diaphragm is deconditioned because it responds to training just like everything else does, like every other muscle does. Um, and so with training, you'll actually, even though it starts out with a high mitochondrial volume, you'll add more and you'll add more capillaries. So when you're out of training, when you're out of shape, the diaphragm has lots of mitochondria, but maybe not enough to keep up with the exercise intensity. And so then you start to produce some lactate which again is that byproduct of producing energy anaerobically. And so then that accumulation of, um, of lactate or that acid accumulation in the diaphragm is what's thought to lead to that, that sensation of um, the side stitch. So as you get in better shape, get more mitochondria, more capillaries, get better able to produce energy aerobically in the diaphragm, and then that, that uh, sensation tends to go away. But the diaphragm isn't the only uh, respiratory muscle or should say ventilatory muscle because then we're moving air so ventilatory is the correct uh, term there so diaphragm isn't the only ventilatory muscle um, you also have intercostal muscles so they're not pictured here but intercostals so again anything costal is ribs inter is between so the intercostal muscles actually sit between the ribs and there's two sets of those there's the external intercostals and their fibers kind of go this way make sure I got my pointer on I do Okay, uh, so the external intercostals, their fibers kind of go this way. And then the internal internal intercostals, their fibers go the opposite direction. So they start here and go here, start here and go here. And why that matters is the external intercostals, because of the their fiber direction, which again, pull my arrow back up, runs this way. The external intercostals, because of their fiber direction, are going to pull the ribs up. And so the external intercostals are involved in inspiration. The internal intercostals are involved in expiration or breathing out, again, when we have to forcefully exhale as we would during exercise. So you got the, in, the intercostals, specifically the external intercostals during inspiration. You also have the sternocleidomastoid, which is a really prominent neck muscle. It's one that um, tells you where it runs. So um, it includes the sternum and the clavicle, and then it runs to the mastoid process, which is just behind your ear. So it's the muscle that when you turn your head to your left or your right, it becomes this really obvious strap muscle there on either side of your neck. Um, so you got sternocleidomastoid. You also have the scalenes, which are other neck muscles, and then the scapular elevators play a role in breathing as well, as does um, pec minor if you're laying on your back. Pec minor can actually inflate the rib cage a little bit. So there are a bunch of muscles that are involved in uh, inspiration. So effectively what happens is, again, so the diaphragm is going to flatten and pull down. That increases the um, the volume inside of the chest cavity. But in addition to that, you're also going to, with the action of those uh, scapular elevators, sternocleidomastoid, the scalenes, and the intercostals, you're also going to pull the rib cage up. So you get this combination of the ribs swing up and out, which is like this little bucket handle here. So the ribs are going to swing up and out because of their action. And then because of the action of the diaphragm, we increase the volume inside the chest and create that vacuum. And so the combination of those two sets of things happening allow us to create that vacuum and to breathe in. During expiration, and again, this is at rest, but during expiration, all we do is relax those muscles. And so if you relax the intercostals, the um, scapular elevators, et cetera, 
Um, if you relax those, then, then gravity is just going to pull your rib cage back down. And so then that decreases the volume inside of the chest cavity and causes you to breathe out. But that happens in addition to the diaphragm is also elastic. And so it's going to snap back to its original shape. And so when that happens, that's also going to expel or force air out of the lungs. So again, primarily a passive process. It's gravity pulling your rib cage down and it's the diaphragm snapping back into its original configuration. And both of those things then push air out of the lungs. All right. So let's talk about lung volumes. So how much air can you move and how much air can your lungs hold? So uh, what you're seeing there is a guy with a spirometer. And so we use spirometers to measure lung volume. So for example, how much air is somebody moving in and out of the lungs with each breath? Or if we ask them to breathe in really deeply, how much additional air did they move in? So um, any of those lung volumes then are measured with spirometers which again is that thing pictured there on the right. So um, in terms of your, your lung volume, the primary determinant of that is actually your uh, size. So the bigger you are, the bigger your lungs are, and so the more air that they can hold. And so with that, then you tend to get higher lung volumes. And so um, size and gender are interrelated in terms of measuring lung volumes with a spirometer. So the bigger you are, again, the bigger your lungs are. And because men tend to be bigger than women, men tend to have higher lung volumes. Um, the other thing on there is age. So lung volume does decrease with age. And there are a few different reasons for that. Um, one is that you it lose some of the elastic fibers around the, um, around the, the uh, bronchioles, around the, the smaller airways. So with that, then um, the lungs are able to hold less. But another thing is related actually to the action of the ribs. So as we age, particularly when we become elderly, like in you know 70s, and really once you start getting into your 80s and older, you start to see where where people assume that kind of kyphotic posture, which is sort of that hunched over, you know, leaned over sort of a posture. Um, if you ever watch The Simpsons, Mr. Burns has a very kyphotic posture, um, and so with that. Obviously, that sort of a posture where you're, you're flexed in your thoracic spine is going to prevent the ribs from swinging up and out quite as easily. And so because they can't do that, you can't inflate the lungs quite as much. And so that's going to inhibit lung volumes. So it's a kind of a combination of you lose some elasticity in the lungs and you lose the ability to swing the ribs up and out with age based on posture. Um, you also get some muscle weakening. So the diaphragm gets a little bit weaker with age. Um, it does have some type two fibers in it. And so you get, you know, loss of the faster twitch fibers in the, in the diaphragm and some of the other breathing muscles as well. But all of those things effectively act to decrease lung volumes with age. All right, so let's talk about static lung volumes. All right, so these are, um, so static meaning that you're just, you're just standing there and we're gonna ask you to uh, breathe in or breathe out is effectively what's happening here. So these are not during exercise. All right, so tidal volume is the air volume that is moved either during the inspiratory, so breathing in, or expiratory phase of each breathing cycle. So what you can see on this picture is that, so you got a guy hooked up to a spirometer, so our little baseline here is two and a half liters. And so when he breathes in, so that's his tidal volume, and he is moving in about half a liter of air, so five, 500 mLs of air. And then he breathes out and he expels the same air. There we go. So breathe in, half a liter, out half a liter, in, out, in, out, etc. So that's the tidal volume then. So his tidal volume, the amount of air that he's moving in during either inspiration or expiration is half a liter. And then the next term on there is inspiratory reserve volume. So inspiratory reserve volume is the difference between the air that you're moving at rest, you know, breathing in, breathing out, um, at rest versus what you could breathe in. So if we say, okay, this guy is just normal breathing here and then take a big breath in. So he can, his lungs can hold as much as three additional liters of air, right? So the inspiratory reserve volume then is the difference between maximal inspiration and tidal volume. And then expiratory reserve volume is if we say, okay, breathe out as hard as you can. Um, so big breath out and hold it. So the difference between 
where we are at a baseline after we breathe out. And then if we actively contract our abdominals, our obliques, um, yeah, it's mostly the abdominal musculature. If we, if we actively contract that abdominal musculature and we, we force out some additional air, we can force out an additional liter and a half. So expiratory reserve volume then is the difference between normal exhalation and maximal exhalation. Um, so inspiratory reserve volume is big breath in, expiratory reserve volume is push it out as hard as you can. And so if we add those two together, that gives us our forced vital capacity. So that is the volume of air that you can move in one breath. So big breath in to take advantage of your inspiratory reserve volume, big breath out, take advantage of your expiratory reserve volume. And so then the combination there, the amount of, of air you can move in one breath is your forced vital capacity. So you can see for this person, big breath in up to six liters. So this person's lungs can hold six liters of air. So big breath in up to six liters and then big breath out down to one. So this person, their forced vital capacity, the amount of air they can move in one breath is five liters. The other thing you see down here, the RLV stands for residual lung volume. Well, what is that? So residual lung volume is the air that's left in the lungs after maximum exhalation. So after you breathe out as hard as you can, you're still gonna have some air in the lungs. The lungs don't totally deflate. And so residual lung volume is actually important for a couple of different reasons. Um, one is that it ensures continuous gas exchange. So if the lungs actually collapse down on themselves every time you breathe out as hard as you could, then you would get some interruption in the gas exchange because of course your heart is gonna keep beating. So you're gonna keep circulating blood past the lungs. And so some of that, that blood would become oxygenated when the alveoli were inflated. Some of it wouldn't if the alveoli had collapsed on themselves. And so to prevent that, a certain amount of air stays in the lungs. So that's your residual lung volume. Um, so that's the primary thing that residual lung volume does. And then the other thing is that it uh, reduces the energy cost of breathing. Because if we actually collapse the alveoli, then it's gonna take a lot more energy to reinflate them. And so combination of reducing the energy cost of breathing plus ensuring consistent oxygenation of the blood, that's what our residual lung volume does for us. So in terms of forced vital capacity, um, again, the amount of air you can move in and out with one breath, the chart that you see here is based on uh, an average size male. Um, so typically in men, the forced vital capacity is somewhere between four and five liters. In women, it's somewhere between three and four liters. But again, that primarily depends upon your stature and it also varies with age. So again, the lungs are gonna lose elasticity with age. And so because of that, um, residual lung volume is going to increase. So you're not gonna be able to, to force out quite as much air after you've breathed out. And so with that, you get a decrease in your expiratory reserve volume. And because you weren't able to inflate the lungs quite as much initially, you also get an encroachment on the inspiratory reserve volume. And so with that, you with aging, then you get an increase in the residual lung volume or the air left in the lungs after you breathe out. All right. So let's Go another slide forward. All right, so dynamic lung volume. So during exercise is, is kind of a way to think about this. These aren't exclusively during exercise, but it's that's a way to think about it. So we'll start with that with the first one. So dynamic ventilation, moving air in and out of the lungs while you're moving. So anything dynamic is moving, all right? So moving in and air out of the lungs while you're moving, it's the product of two things, which is the maximal force vital capacity. So that is how much air are you capable of moving? And then the second thing on there is the velocity of flow, which is effectively how many breaths per minute are you taking? So a way to think about dynamic ventilation or, or air movement during exercise is similar to stroke volume. Remember the stroke, or not stroke volume, sorry, cardiac output. So got to, got to a concept too early. So it's similar to the concept of cardiac output, which remember cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped by the heart per minute and cardiac output is the product of heart rate and stroke volume. So maximal force vital capacity on there, that's the first thing, that's equivalent to or analogous to stroke volume, and then velocity of flow is breathing rate. So very similar concept here. All right, moving forward another one, maybe, there we go. So forced expiratory reserve volume, and sometimes you'll see it as F FEV1, um, depends on which book you're looking at. Um, but forced expiratory reserve volume is the same thing as forced vital capacity with a one second limit. 
And so essentially it is a measure of expiratory power. How, how fast or how uh, thoroughly in a short period of time can you expel air? Can you breathe out? So, um, and the reason that this measure is used, that, that forced expiratory volume is used as a measure sometimes, is that individuals with lung disease can achieve near normal forced vital capacity measures if there's no time limit. So even though they have lung disease, they have good enough function. They can, they can achieve a similar uh, residual lung volume or essentially uh, total lung volume, their force vital capacity, if you give them, you know, 15 seconds to do it. So again, what this is going to do or what, what FEV does is looks at expiratory power. So healthy individuals can typically expel about 85% of their force vital capacity in one second. If individuals have... Uh, are able to expel 70% or less of the air that they breathe in in one second, so 70% or less of forced vital capacity, then that's considered an obstructed measure. Those are um, lungs that are ineffective. And sometimes, if you've got somebody with really severe lung disease, there, are, there have been measures as low as 40%. So that's a, a really significant reduction in expiratory volume or in lung power is a way to think about that. All right, so maximum voluntary ventilation. What's happening here is in for one minute, you say, okay, take a big breath in, big breath out, and just keep doing that for a minute. That's maximum voluntary ventilation. You're not, you're not running, you're not moving. You're um, just seated or sometimes standing. I forget how they do this one, but you're stationary at the very least. And then big breath in, big breath out, do it for, for one minute consecutively. And it's a measure of how much total air can you move in a minute. That's your, your maximum voluntary ventilation. So, and the reason I mentioned that, uh, and this is an important concept as it pertains to exercise performance, is that um, the values that people are able to achieve during a maximum vent voluntary ventilation test are typically higher than they ever achieve during a, an exhausting aerobic capacity test. So if you put somebody on a treadmill and say, all right, we're going to have you... Uh, we're going to try to find your aerobic capacity. So we're going to gradually increase the speed and incline of this treadmill and see um, how much air you can move. When they, when they stop or when they plateau, their lungs are actually physically capable of moving more air. So typically, um, once they've sort of plateaued in the volume of air that they're going to move during an exercise test, that's about 25% lower than they would achieve during maximum voluntary ventilation. So why does that matter? It matters because you are physically capable of moving more air from a, from a lung standpoint, from a pulmonary standpoint. You're physically capable of moving more air during exercise than you're able to ever actually achieve. And so from a why does it matter standpoint, um, your aerobic capacity is determined not by lung function, assuming you don't have any sort of lung disease or insufficiency, but your ability to endure during maximal aerobic exercise is determined by the efficiency of your heart. So you gotta be able to circulate that blood that's carrying oxygen. And then the ability of the working tissues, so particularly skeletal muscle, to use the oxygen that's delivered to them. So in several other classes, you'll talk a lot about the concept of aerobic capacity. So it is, it is effectively a measure of um, how well you deliver and use oxygen. And so what I want you to get from this part is that the lungs are not the not the limiting factor here even during maximal exercise you're capable of moving more air than you actually achieve during that maximal test um, so the lungs aren't the hold up and in fact the hold up is the heart so it's inability to circulate the blood fast enough or the inability of the working tissues so again particularly skeletal muscles to be able to use that oxygen so my little note there during exercise so um one of the things we see is, is if you have elite level marathoners and have them do the maximum voluntary ventilation test where they're just, you know, being stationary and moving as much air as they can, they're, the amount of air that they're able to move is essentially the same as untrained control. So both of their lungs work equally well. The reason the, the elite marathoner is an elite marathoner is that their heart works much better and then their muscles have adapted to be able to use the oxygen that they're exposed to much more uh, much more efficiently. There's a little bit of difference sometimes in swimmers. Um, so swimmers sometimes, especially your endurance swimmers, may have a little bit larger lung volumes than we'd expect. And the, the theory is that that's because of uh, the nature of swimming. So because you are um, 
horizontal and in the water, there's a constant resistance to breathing in. So um, you're, you're having to push against that, that water pressure. And so because of that, the thought is that the, um, the swimming, pushing against the water, actually acts partially as a respiratory muscle trainer. And then the other thing is that um, swimmers obviously have to hold their breath. So they're not, they're not breathing. Um, you know, they're, they are taking uh, a couple of strokes and then breathing and then holding their breath taking a couple strokes and then breathing. And so that may play a, a role in um, them having higher than higher lung volumes than we would anticipate as well. So again, the one thing I want you to get from this slide is that maximum exercise is not limited by ventilation, is not limited by our ability to move air. Maximum exercise is limited by our heart or by skeletal muscles. All right, and then the last slide for today, um, minute ventilation. So minute ventilation is the volume of air breathed in each minute. And so obviously that's going to change between exercise and rest. So for most of us at rest, at rest, we breathe about 12 times per minute. So normal tidal volume is about half a liter. So again, tidal volume is the air breathed, the air moved during either inspiration or expiration. So if we'll assume, let's take inspiration. So you breathe in half a liter, take 12 breaths a minute, so if we multiply that out, we end up with, for most people, six liters per minute is at rest is their minute ventilation. So most people move about six liters of air per minute at rest. Obviously, that's going to change during exercise. Um, so during exercise, your breathing rate is going to change from 12 breaths a minute to maybe 35 or 45 if you are a decently in-shape college student. Um, if you're an elite athlete, breathing rate can, can achieve 60 or 70 times per minute. So you can have a really high uh, breathing rate. In addition to that, tidal volume is also going to increase because, of course, we're going to encroach on our inspiratory reserve volume and our expiratory reserve volume. And so that's what this picture shows. So you can see, so at rest, here's our normal tidal volume. And then as we start to exercise, we're going to breathe more deeply and also more frequently. And so that tidal volume, the amount of air moved, during inspiration or expiration is going to increase. And so then we encroach on inspiratory reserve volume and expiratory reserve volume. And so that's what allows us to take deeper breaths. So tidal volume is going to increase up to two liters. And so if you've got an elite athlete with a really big tidal volume, um, values as high as 200 liters per minute have been reported. For your average person, it's more like 100 liters per minute. But still, that's 70 to, or sorry, 17, not 70, 17 to 20 times their resting value. So we can, we can move a lot of air um, during exercise. A couple other things on there. So the concept of anatomic dead space. So again, remember we talked about the conducting zone versus the respiratory zone. So not all of the air that you breathe in is going to make it down into the respiratory zone. So not all of that air is going to participate in gas exchange. And so um, the air that doesn't make it down into the alveoli or into one of those respiratory bronchioles at least is referred to as, as being in anatomic dead space. It's where, where gas exchange doesn't take place. Anatomic dead space um, is something that can be increased. So obviously lung disease would increase anatomic dead space. Um, so you know if you've got collapsing of alveoli because of cigarette smoking and that kind of stuff, that's going to increase that dead space as well. So it's, it's just um, places where we're not able to get uh, respiration. We're not able to get gas exchange. All right, in terms of rate versus depth, um, initially you're gonna get, so when you start exercise, you're gonna get a, a, an increase in depth first, followed by an increase in rate. So you breathe, you encroach on, on your reserve volumes first, and then you start breathing faster. And then the last thing on there is hyperventilation. So effectively what you've got there is that um, pulmonary ventilation, so air into the lungs, exceeds the oxygen needs of metabolism. You're breathing faster than you need to be. So one of the things you get with that, when people hyperventilate, they tend to feel lightheaded. And so effectively what happens is you actually uh, blow off too much carbon dioxide, and that changes the acid-base balance of the blood a little bit. So you get a, a decrease in hydrogen ions, which makes the blood more, more basic. And so that change in pH of the blood is what tends to lead to that feeling of lightheadedness. And then that change in pH can also produce a, a temporary unconsciousness. So once you, once you faint or once you have a, a syncopal episode, syncope is fainting. Uh, once you faint, usually, because um, oftentimes hyperventilation is caused by um, psychological factors. So after you faint, that's removed, and then a respiration rate, or sorry, a ventilation rate returns to normal. And so then 
people tend to return to consciousness pretty quickly. All right, so that's it for the lungs part one. So next time we'll get into talking about actual gas exchange. So I'll make that lecture here pretty quick and post it. So that way we keep these things under an hour and a half. So we'll see you next time.